Welcome to In the Envelope, an awards podcast. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage. I'm here to give you a front row seat to the Emmys, Oscars, SAG, and Tony's races. Who is in the running? What makes an award-worthy performance? And what are the secrets to giving one? These intimate, inspirational conversations with some of today's most talented stars provide you, dear listener, the kind of craft and career advice that could win you a statue of your own, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. If you aren't able in the moment to say, like, this is special, this is meaningful, and really believe it, then it makes it a lot harder when all of the rejection comes because it feels like everything is not enough. Wait, wait, hold up. Okay, so you're going to do the intro, and then then you're going to be like, hey, Brianna. By the way, who's here? Yeah. (laughs) We're totally winning that. Yeah. Cool. In fact, let's just keep going. Um, (laughs) Welcome back, listeners, because In the Envelope is back Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yay! Um, Listeners, every Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next month, we have exclusive interviews with amazing nominated talent. First, Tony nominated talent, and then we're going to go right into Emmy contenders. And let me tell you, we have some great, amazing guests. But... Speaking of guests, Brianna, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello. We yes, I do. No nope. special guest today. No. Nope. Yeah, you're doing it. Yeah, go. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, who are you? I am Brianna Rodriguez. Good, good, I good. am the managing editor at Backstage. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Love um, it. You Somebody and the other day was like, in the envelope. And I was like, great. It's I've the... been saying it wrong for years. <laughs> it's a tomato tomato situation. It's so, yeah, it so is. Yeah, it's yeah. So yeah, yeah. And you and I worked together for like long time. A long time. Longer than anyone. And I'm really excited to be on the podcast. I'm here we are in conference room too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's also it's there's very a glamorous. party going on outside. Which <laughs> let's pretend that that party is for the fact that this podcast has been around for almost two years. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. But yes. today's guest is Tony nominee, Mm -hmm. Celia Keenan-Bolger. Who's incredible. Who's incredible. And I sort of just invited Brianna here because, first of all, Brianna wrote this lovely cover story that you can all see, listeners. No. I brought the cover story here. But we talk about Celia. Like, first of all, what was this, what was interviewing her like? Celia is amazing. Being in a room, we were in the room with Aaron Sorkin, Jeff Daniels, Latanya Richardson-Jackson, and then Celia. Uh And it's this is for the Broadway production. This is for the Broadway production. To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes, and we did we did the cover interview, and it was amazing. And it's amazing. hard to be. I feel like in a room of four other people, that many people sh- too. like shine that level of talent. And yeah. Celia, as soon as she opens her mouth, I'm enamored. Whatever's gonna happen, yeah, yeah. whatever she's gonna say, I'm here for. She's so thoughtful with her mm-hmm. answers, as you will hear, totally. listener. Totally. Um, but she she I think that she does the work on her own and then when she comes forward and you ask her a question about she's already thought about it totally and and so she Mm. when she talks you're just like so she's very in love with her yeah because she's so present that's a good that's a great way to put it like she's constantly just totally and i've seen her on stages for years and i feel like the thing that i've always said about her is that she almost doesn't need lighting she brings her own yeah in inner illumination like that's what she does she's amazing and she certainly does that as scout finch um, and we talked about that a little, but honestly, we the ratio, I would say, of like evergreen acting advice and life advice outweighed the Mockingbird stuff because we did a full cover story on To Kill a Mockingbird. Right, fact, right. We'll link to that in the description. Everybody can go read that it's also. It's great. And she's just incredible. Honestly, like, I can't say she's enough amazing, amazing things about yeah. Celia. Like, I want to be best friends with her. Celia! Yes! <laughs> oh my God, yes. Celia. Is she listening? Are you listening? I hope. We love you. We love you. <laughs> Seriously, Celia, if you're listening, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm so excited that she's the one to kick off this this season, this yeah. round of episodes of the podcast. I feel like there's probably things I'm forgetting that we're supposed to set up in this <laughs> interview, but I think we should just get to it. Um, thank you for joining us, Brianna. Thank you for having me. Enjoy <laughs> the episode, guys. Yay! <laughs> Hello there, this is Jamie, host of In the Envelope's sister podcast, VO School. 
If you're looking to get into the voiceover industry, check out Launch by the VO School podcast. This is a series of 15 lessons one-to-one with me, and we cover everything you need to know to get started. We cover performance, the voiceover genres, marketing and business, and setting up your home studio. This is for anyone who's at the beginning or early on in their voiceover career, and you can connect with me online via Skype or Zoom, or come to my Philly studio for in-person classes. To find out more, go to voschoollaunch.com. Yes, there's two L's in the middle of that. And send me a quick message on the contact page. That's voschoollaunch.com. Illuminating every stage she's ever set foot on, Celia Keenan-Bolger has, for years, been one of New York's most respected actors and community activists. Originally from Detroit, she's been nominated for a total of four Tony Awards for the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, Peter and the Starcatcher, The Glass Menagerie, and currently, Aaron Sorkin's acclaimed adaptation of the Harper Lee classic, To Kill a Mockingbird. Here it is, our interview with Scout Finch herself, Celia Keenan-Bolger. Do you have to think about vocal rest and taking care of your voice? It's, yes. I feel like it's so interesting. Like, in the past, I have, you know, it just, it's like my voice has always been, and obviously because I did musicals for so long, like, I have a complicated relationship to it and being tired and all of that. I have my voice teacher from college Mm. is here on sabbatical. Oh, interesting. And she gave me a warm-up that has, like... (gasps) You needed that. I, it's like... It really has carried me through. Like, I have not... When we first started, I was like, ah, ah, I'm tired. But I think that's just, like, the muscle trying to, like, yeah. figure out how are we supposed to do this eight times a week. Right. Yeah. And now even if I come in, like, really tired, she's able. I'm able to, like, do this whole warm-up and mm-hmm. get myself there. So, like, vocal warm-ups or any, any of those kind of actorly skills are the kind of thing that you don't learn once and then you've mastered it forever. Correct. You need to re- be reminded. Yes. And then I even think, like, different shows require different warm-ups. That, like, so much sure. of this part is, like, pitched. Mm. I, like, talk up here when I'm Little Scout. Uh-huh. And then when I'm, you know older i have to be way down here and so it's just like you're i have to make sure like all of that is yeah being accounted for in the warm-up whereas like laura in the glass menagerie like talk like this the whole time like a (laughs) tiny whisper so right and all completely different from musicals which are definitely different one to the next Mm -hmm. yeah I've been really lucky. There's a lot of, I feel like one of the themes of the Tony nominated actors this year is that a lot of them are like both play and musical people. Yes. You know? It makes me so excited because on this project in particular, I feel like mm. there's such music to Aaron Sorkin's writing. There's, oh. there's music to all great writers. I felt that mm-hmm. way about Tennessee Williams. Mm. I felt that way about Rick Ellis, like that you have to understand rhythm and. Cool. And that musical training, like, actually does help you, like, see something on the page and know, like, where it, how it needs to fit in. Cool. And that's, like, an artistic, um, it's both, like, a practical skill thing, but also, like, a you develop a taste. Correct. For, and like, that it's just, like, instinctual. Rhythms. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you were saying just now that, I mean, I guess it's in reference to the press aspect of this, but, like... The danger of being on Broadway is getting burned out, mm-hmm. and I think especially when you're Tony nominated and it's May, mm-hmm. there's a lot. I mean, how do you survive? It sounds like you've either got it down, but also needs. Is that something you got to learn or relearn? You know. You know, I had a performance like a month ago, where before, like, I got to the theater and I was just feeling a little overwhelmed, and I think something that I sort of like part of my identity both as a person and as a performer, is that I'm, like, a pretty steady individual, and I'm pretty Mm. strong. And at half hour, I was just feeling, like, pretty weepy and a little bit, Mm. like, unhinged. And, like, we came downstairs, and one of the other actresses in the cast was like, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm doing okay. And she was like, are you sure? Oh. And I started to cry. Wow. And then, like, couldn't get it together. Yeah. And, like... 
they were like, okay, place this. And I was just like <laughs> still crying. Oh my God. And I was like, this is, this has never happened to me before. And I'm feeling extremely vulnerable because it's also like in terms of my identity, I was like, I'm not a person who can't like get their shit together. And here I am just like in a bad way. The curtain is like mm. coming up. I'm like wiping tears away. Wow. And every, both Gideon and Will were like, what happened? Like, Something what happened? happened? Right. And I was like, no. No. <laughs> and I think I realized, I was like, you know, I think my brain is not receiving the messages. And so my body was like, mm. okay, I'm just going to break down for a moment so that the brain can understand, mm. like, you are stretched too thin mm. or you are not taking the time for yourself. and. Yeah. It weirdly, like during this time when it's so busy, I feel like my phone feels like this wonderful refuge to be like, that's like the reward. Oh, mm -mm. And it turns out it's really, it's just really not true. No, I find the same thing. So I, I was so like, true. instead yeah. of like sitting and, and like feeling like I was enjoying time on my phone, I was like, put the phone down. I have since that breakdown read six memoirs. <laughs> oh my God. Good. Uh -huh. Just I memoirs. don't even say that to be like only memoirs because I was Why like fiction that? feels somehow like it requires my brain to be like okay where are we who are these oh, people do I have to remember their names it's like with a memoir <laughs> immediately I'm like I know where I am I know it feels voyeuristic in the way that I feel like how interesting a phone sort of gives that same like it doesn't feel like work at all and okay you think of it as work yeah 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 or, not or that like yeah that it's I'm like the shutting down my brain. Opposite, and it's been since election day, twenty sixteen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if that's related, but I think it is. That I can't read a word of nonfiction. I read articles still, uh -huh. but I have to be immersed in a fiction in a yep. fictive world. That totally makes. Sense. And maybe because <laughs> right. I'm living in a fictional world eight times a week, that there's yeah. like a counterbalance oh, mm -hmm. that I'm like in pursuit of. But sure. And I get the thing about, like, you you don't have to keep track of other characters. Yeah. Yeah. It's really also just about, like, the first chapter. It's like, am I in or not? And with a memoir, Ooh. it's pretty easy. That, sure. That, I, like, my brain doesn't have the bandwidth right now to work a little bit harder to be like, I'm going to invest in this because everybody yeah. says this is an amazing book or this is by an author that I really love. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're a storyteller, and those are those are stories told by people. Yes. That's part of it. I do think that phones, it's just going to increasingly become part of our conversation as a society that, like, we're, it's a mass addiction that we don't know the effects of yet. Like, mm -hmm. the data is starting to come out, and it's not looking good. I also feel like my relationship to it went from, like, totally, yeah. like, pretty healthy to not yeah. in a pretty quick amount of time. And I don't know if that's because of like mm. advertising and that they know what these apps like know so much more about us. So they're oh, targeting yeah. us and trying to sort of destabilize us and make us purchase more things. Like I have no sure. idea. But it does feel like in the way that it used to feel like this like little reward, it now yeah. feels like it's more sort of anxiety producing. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, and it, oh, I always come back to that idea of um, Steve Jobs when he was asked about iPads and like, would you give your kid an iPad yourself? No and he was like, absolutely not. <laughs> by the way, really Small damning. Fry by Lisa Brennan Jobs is a wonderful <laughs> memoir that I highly recommend. There you go. Mm -hmm. I have on this list of, speaking of children, I have on this list of questions that we can go through this lovely list. Um, you're a mom. And you're, you just said in your Instagram stories you're going to the gym and you're going to therapy and there's all these things that you're... How are you... Um, is Do you have... Do you compartmentalize? Is it your artistic life and then your personal life and your political life? Or is it all one? I think I would really hope that I could say that it's all one. But I think in order to exist in the world, I do have to do a little bit of compartmentalizing. To manage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that having a child has been in this process I feel like I in the morning like getting to wake up with him in the morning I've never had a duality that is so strong which is that like in my old life I could sort of like recharge the batteries and sleep until at least 10 mm -hmm. and sometimes oh. later and have a morning to myself and figure out like okay how is the day gonna go and now I'm like pretty much at a solid like 6 30 7 a.m wake up every day that's a big difference and because because i don't get to see him for a lot of other times during the day that that that's like those that morning time is so precious and mm -hmm. like 
I think um, I really value that. But I also, there are mornings where I'm like, oh, my God, I am so tired. And I don't have as much to offer as I wish I I had. Mm. Um, But I also think in the way that I have heard so many mothers talk about and that only really came to me recently, that my work has been, like, very, very much enriched by this presence in my life and this child um and and my relationship i feel like i'm so lucky because i have a partner who is like an extraordinary actor and who can give good counsel and advice when i'm feeling like what's happening and who also is like a really incredible father and Mm -hmm. um and husband and has is like more of a feminist than I maybe even understood when I married him, though I knew that to be true. But that he, his ability to like take on making lunches and making dinner every mm-hmm. night and putting our child wow. to bed is like, you know, he's, he has done that. And so, mm. and then the work, it feels like the work right now, it won't always be this way, but right now the work feels like so much of the day. Mm. Um, both in the performing of it and then also the the you know promoting it yeah um but it's i think the thing that i felt the most is a sort of deficiency in all aspects <laughs> of my life <laughs> which is that i like wish i could be a better actor at night be- and not be so tired and feel mm. like so spread thin that that i wish i had the energy that i had pre um, motherhood. I wish that I could be a better mother to my son and be around more and um, not so tired in the morning when I wake up with him because I was working until, you know, 11 at night, mm. the night before. But that, and this sort of notion of like having it all, which I, I most certainly do have more than I would say I ever have in my life is not lost on me. Like all of the things that I wanted have sort of come true. I wanted a family. I wanted to be in a big fancy Broadway show and have a huge part in it. And it's not lost on me that I get to have all of those things. But it also is not lost on me how uh, I thought that I would handle all of it a little bit better and feel like I was doing it a little bit better. Right, but and that's a constant thing of of forgiving yourself or being generous to yourself, mm-hmm. and treating yourself. And I do like, think, luckily, I have a husband who, yeah, reminds me of that and makes you know, and takes on a lot of things when I can't. Yeah, well, and is it true too that the something maybe it's something about the regularity of of the Broadway schedule, but like, or maybe even the rhythm of, for example, Aaron Sorkin's mm-hmm. dialogue, like. Do you find you tweeted the other day about a kid who burst into tears in the audience and like that's so beautiful like are there moments in the work in the in the day to day and in the repetition that almost breathe the inspiration back into you and like completely, restore you completely yeah. and I would say this more than almost anything I've ever been a part of I think particularly because it's coming at a time in our culture when I think our culture actually needs this play, when I need this play. And I think watching a child process Tom Robinson being found guilty or having Sonia Sotomayor come backstage and say, like, this is a really, really important piece of art that you're putting out into the world. Or my friend who is a lawyer saying, like, I'm I'm watch. I'm so moved to watch like somebody fighting for what they think is right and failing sometimes and excelling sometimes, mm. and that the reach feels um, not just like to the audience, but inside of myself, like like incredibly gratifying. Mm-hmm. Um, and the like, it's not shallow, but but walking into the Schubert Theater, like I mm. love the group of people that is assembled in that cast so much. And that helps, even on the days where you're like, I'm I'm terrible in the play. Oh, the play oh is no. So, you know, after you do it 200 plus times, you're just going to have a few shows where you're like, oh, boy, God, I'm, ba- I'm so bad. No. But that you get to, like, go and hang out with Gideon Glick and Will Pullen. And, mm-hmm. and we, you know, like the cast, I don't really know how this happened. But before the show, the stage manager calls five minutes five minutes before five 
And oh. so we all come downstairs onto the stage and every people call it like the make them social. And for like five <laughs> to ten minutes, depending on how long it takes the audience to get in their seats, mm. we just like walk around, say hi, ask everybody like, what'd you have for dinner? Um, and just sort of catch up. And it's so, with a big cast like that, sure. it's it feels really important. We started doing it like the very first day we got on stage, or like when we were doing run throughs oh. of the show, and that it's just like laying eyes on everybody before mm-hmm. you're on stage with everyone. And it's, I think, that little meeting before every performance is like very indicative of the kind of little small army of actors that is yeah. <laughs> coming to work. Yeah, it's that power of ritual too, of like mm-hmm. coming together. Yes. And moving. Being, yeah, not just an individual in those moments. Yes. Yeah. And I think the coming together, I've talked about this a little bit in, in other interviews, but that I think that as a country, we are so hungry for place for a place to go to and process these big questions about our country. Mm. Mm. That as, as, as a community, like there's church, sure. which is a, like mm. one place where you can do that. But, but church and theater, it's like... Same thing, yeah, really. Correct. <laughs> Truly. And that, that has been something that I have felt was really present in these audiences getting to be with, like, 1,400 other people and watching, like, this play about where we've been and where we're going. And that has felt also very nourishing on the nights when I was like, yeah. oh, my gosh, I can't believe we're going to do this again. Yeah. Well, and, you, and you've said, too, like, I, and I want to ask about your kind of political background. It sounds like your early life was very much, your whole life has been defined by political activism. This production feels much more like activism or that you get to indulge in that thinking more than maybe any other production you've done. Yes. It's so moving to me. I mean, I said to Bart when I was first offered this role, I was like, I feel like I've been waiting my whole life for this experience. Uh, That like so many parts of my Cool. my being are being like brought into that room and it particularly i mean i expect to see really culturally relevant and um challenging works of theater off broadway but mm. for a commercial <laughs> broadway play to sort of do what i think this production aims to do one of the ca- one of our cast members tom hammond he was like i feel like the tiniest part of the resistance. Mm. And I was like, that's so beautiful. And in totally. a good way, it's, it's. I think the play is for everyone. Like it's not just for, you know, liberal. <laughs> Leftists. Yeah, New Yorkers, yeah. elite. Um, <laughs> it's for everyone. And I think it has, it, it really does pose big questions about the North and the South and mm. empathy and facts and that we all, you know, we are at a place in our in our country's history that yeah. that we want a place to go to think about those mm-hmm. those questions. There was a teacher that we did a student matinee yesterday, and this teacher emailed me. We had been in touch before the show, and she was like, "It was a four hour bus ride back to Connecticut, and the kids mm-hmm. talked about the play the entire time." That is cool. It is. Wow. They're so captivated by it. Yeah. They're so not jaded and like. Yeah. I, I it's not felt, cheesy. Yeah, ex- I know. <laughs> and I will never, I, I've never felt more proud to <sighs> earn a laugh than from a student matinee where Tell I was like, they're not it. giving them away for free. No. So if they laugh, they actually think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Who's that comedian who said the thing about like middle schoolers are accurate when they make fun of you? That's what makes right? it so devastating. <laughs> so, totally. <laughs> totally. You, if you pass that test, you're. And that's, like that's really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, to go back to the very beginning, because Detroit, you grew up in Detroit with politically active parents, mm-hmm. but not performing arts parents. Correct. The performing arts thing was you and your siblings. Yeah, kind of introduce that to the family. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I mean, my parents were very um, engaged with the arts, and my grandparents mm-hmm. lived like two blocks away, and they were. Um, Mm -hmm. They were also really interested in the arts. And, you know, we were like lower middle class, I would Mm -hmm. say. But we were culturally rich. Mm -hmm. And, 
you know, there was a lot of music in our homes. There was, um, my grandparents would take me to the theater and to the symphony. And so there was a lot of, of that influence. But my mom was a public school teacher. My dad was an urban planner. They met at like a socialist meeting in Detroit. <laughs> and, um, and they took me to a children's theater production of The Sound of Music. Aha. Uh-huh. And that was where it all began. And, you know, I also, like, played soccer and did gymnastics. Uh, mm-hmm. But I was like, I want to do that, too. And they were like, okay. Cool. Yeah. And it just turned out, like, as time goes on, which, you know, as a young person, you have to make the decisions. Like, are you going to do travel soccer or are you going to keep doing theater? And I kept choosing mm-hmm. to keep doing theater. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and my parents were so supportive without being overbearing. I think that is Mm. the greatest gift that they gave me is that they schlepped me all over the metropolitan Detroit area so that I could keep being in plays. But they never had any skin in the game. Like I don't, I didn't feel Mm. like either of them was sort of trying to live out a fantasy that they'd never gotten to have or that they needed me to be famous or needed me to be... um, didn't have to be a career. No. Yeah. Just they just passion. saw that it, like, yeah, brought me a lot of joy. Yeah. And that's all it takes, I guess. Yeah. And then to make the, it's, I mean, as we've said, it's the sacrifices. It's all about the, everything comes with, like, a cost. And if that means schlepping somebody around or if that means, like, just reprioritizing so that yeah. you can make that happen for somebody. Yeah. It was really, I also think my mother was so, she was, like, such an incredible woman. She was just, she gave me early lessons like I remember there would be auditions for like some show and she would say we should make you know we, she would call other parents and say like they're you know they're doing Oliver or like mm-hmm. they're doing this and that her whole philosophy was like there's enough for everyone there are enough parts oh, cool. for everyone yeah and that it was never this sort of like competitive yeah uh pursuit And so it was, like, ingrained in me from a young age that it's, like, you know, and, of course, I still grapple with, like, other people's successes not being my failure. Uh, That's just built in. Yes. But totally. the sort of compare and despair Uh was, I feel like she tried to alleviate that. Like, she understood early on that this was not a competition and that, you know, the more generous you could be, the better it would turn out for you. And that Mm. I still am living by those principles. Yeah, and and working to resist, I feel like, the goal of any artist, but mostly actors, I feel like, is to resist the, I love that, um, compare and despair. I've never heard it put that way. It's it's real. (laughs) It's real. And we've heard on this podcast a lot, like the, because we're all about the early, you know, the early career, the Mm -hmm. struggling actors type of life. And so much of that is rejection, of course, but also so much of that is... You see friends, you see enemies, you know, you see people succeed. And like you said, it's not, it has nothing to do with your own. It's not even a failure. It's not even your failure. Yeah. But boy, is it easy to think that. Oh my gosh. It's, <laughs> and it never goes away. I mean, I think. That's really good to hear. Yeah. That you, you have to, it's like going to the gym. You have to like mentally mm. uh, train your brain to say, I keep moving forward and I spend, if I spend all of my energy like looking sideways, mm. it will not serve me. Yeah. It's like, what do I have control over? But that takes so much energy. It doesn't come naturally. It takes energy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Helena York, who was just here in oh this studio. <laughs> I love her so much. <laughs> she said that she loves you too. Um, She gives herself, specifically about auditions and rejections, like she gives herself a period to mourn. Yeah. And then she leaves it behind. I think that is really good, too, because I think there was a time when I would just say, like, you you should be bigger than feeling sad about this loss. Like, you should be able to just, like, bounce back from this. And I think there are jobs that you can get really invested in. Mm -hmm. and, and, And you should let yourself feel sad about it. Yeah. And then... That's a, onward. <laughs> and then onward. Yeah. Because sitting in it and stewing in it and, yeah, like looking sideways, like you said, mm-hmm. it it's ultimately also, doesn't help. You experience so much more rejection than not yeah. that if you collect all that rejection, you're sort of built on something that is is toxic and mm. 
um, and can make you, if you really examine it, can make you feel terrible about yourself. Mm -hmm. And and it's everywhere. It's like if you look for it, don't worry, <laughs> it's there. Exactly. So it, right. it does. It's like a practice, I think, to sort of say, not to. It's not that you're not acknowledging it, but that it's that you acknowledge right. it and then you you try to move on from it. Yeah, because God forbid it eclipses like the reason you got into this in the first place or your or passion. what you actually do have. I mean, I think that's something that. Right. It's so oh. easy to say to say like, well, yeah, I did that, but why can't I have this? Right. And mm. that if you're not appreciating, and you know, it's so hard because every job ends, and so you're constantly yeah. in pursuit of the next thing. <laughs> but if you aren't able in the moment to say like, this is special, this is yeah. meaningful, yeah, and really believe it, yeah. then it makes it a lot harder when all of the rejection comes because it feels like everything is not enough. Right. That thing of like focusing on only what you can control, it's maybe the same, I'm like making this connection that maybe it's the same as focusing on what you have rather than what you don't. Like yes. gratitude for what you have rather than doing the thing of like, but I could have that. Yes. Or I wanted to have that. Or yes. It's the same thing maybe. I think it really is. And it takes a lot of practice. It really does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And you've experienced your own dry spells, and of course, yeah. You know, my our my son's babysitter is this incredible woman and a wonderful actress. And she said she was like one of the greatest gifts working for you and John is seeing how much time you are unemployed. Ugh. And I was like, oh. Cool. But Ugh. she was like, you know, you just assume that once people get to a certain level. Oh, yeah. A day doesn't go by where you don't yeah. have like flooded with offers. Or yeah, something. yeah. And of course, you know, there that is just the nature of the beast. Yeah. And and I think again, like life's work is becoming comfortable with mm. the downtime. Comfortable Ugh, or totally. Yeah. And forgiving yourself. <laughs> yes, and and sometimes I mean, like when this job is over, I'm gonna be so appreciative. Uh huh. Uh huh. For probably like three weeks, and then I'm going to be in a say, tailspin. There's a time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a window of time, and then there's a next step to yes. this, and that could be devastating. Maybe. Yes. The post-show blues are a oh, real thing. Oh my gosh, they really, really are. It's I, like it's insane. You're mourning so many things. I yeah. think structure, people, yeah. characters. I mean, it depends on the experience, but yeah. And someone put it to me like, for most other jobs in the world. You spend two or three months trying to get a gig for two or three years. And as an actor, you spend maybe sometimes two or three years to get a gig for two or three months. Yeah. And that's those periods of like, ride those waves of... Yes, indeed. <laughs> Appreciate what you have. Appreciate what you have. Don't get hung up on what you don't. And the future is like, whatever. It's not... It's What are you going to do? Yeah. That's not in your control. And exactly. Like, yeah. I, I even... If I sort of look back on my career, I'm like, I could never have mm -hmm. imagined that this is where I would be. Sure. And so all of the ways, and I think, you know, it's it's good to have ideas about where you want to go and what things you want to pursue. But again, it's like have them and then let them go because <sighs> trying to control it, it, I think it, you know, it's it can make things harder that you have to, you have to yeah. sort of ride the wave, what you just said. Yeah. And makes me think of like the uncertain political times we live in too, or like the exercise in focusing on what you can't, you know, focusing on what you can control is when yes. it feels like there's a lot that we can't. Yes. Is um, crucial, but is. exhausting. Yes. That takes the energy, like you said. And I think it, that sometimes you have to just be gentle with yourself and say like, I maybe need to take a month off from auditioning, or I need mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. like go crazy and do every open call that mm. I can't like just the, the rules that you set for yourself that they, they can be helpful and know that they can change and that cool. that is not like a failure or a I mean I remember there was a point where I was like no more kids I don't want to play kids anymore oh okay and here I am <laughs> like you that said you like, never could have imagined yeah. yeah and that I think you know for that moment I felt like I want other opportunities and I got some of them, but then mm -hmm. when other things came around, I was like, well, I'm not going to say no. I want to work with all these people. So, sure. you know, then you just have to sort of play fast and loose with the rules and say, well, right. you know, this served me for a time and now it doesn't. Right. And when you say you had the 
I mean, what was the initially, like, where did you want to end up? Obviously, like you just said, it changes all the time. But like when you were a kid, did you want to be this? The Broadway? I mean, I think I wanted to be on Broadway. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, I really did. Musicals or plays? or No, both? musicals. Musicals. Yeah, cool. But beyond that, like, I'm not sure that I really... And the truth is, I don't even know that it was Broadway. It was like I wanted mm. to be a professional actor. I wanted to, to act for my whole life. Yeah. And I think I knew I wanted to do it in New York. But also because cool. I didn't go to New York until high school, Broadway wasn't... It didn't loom quite as large mm. as it did, certainly, like, once I got to college. And, like, it was like, that's what we're heading heading towards. Cool. Okay. Um, but that I just knew I really wanted to be an actor. Yeah. So the New York thing was actually more of a later. It was more like, how do I become an actor in Broadway? Yes. Like, and that it was like, where can you do that? Maybe Chicago. Yeah, sure. Maybe Seattle. Yeah. Maybe Los Angeles. Uh, definitely Los Angeles. And then what was the um, the journey from college? Like, at what point was the, did you have a big break? Or did you have, like, a role that kind of? I was so lucky because we had... We did our senior showcase, and two what was, guys. What did that entail? I sang um, thirty-two bars of "I Think I May Want to Remember Today" by Maltby and Shire. Okay, <laughs> never heard of it. Nope. Um, <laughs> and that was that. I mean, that was it. You just like sang right. thirty-two bars, and that was it. Uh-huh. And you got like meetings with agents, uh-huh. and there a lot of alumni from Michigan came and two alumni happened to be writing a show called Summer of 42 that was a new musical that was going to good speed that summer cool. that had three high school girls in it okay and they saw the showcase and were like I think you would be great for one of these parts will you come and audition and I got that job so like yeah. I was just I think this I guess like the summer that I graduated I got to go or it was like the fall I got to go and do this job at the Goodspeed at Opera Goodspeed. House and, like, develop a new musical, which I had never done before That's in so college. Cool. Yeah. And that sort of got me on the track where I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to do new musicals. Yeah. You've done a lot of new work. I think yeah. your ratio of new work to revivals is very high. Yes. I think that's right. And that was, performer. that was, I mean, I would say that it's intentional, but that was what mm. for, like, especially early on, like, really, really drove me. I loved the collaboration. I mm-hmm. loved creating something out of nothing. Mm. Um, yeah. Or sh- I should say interpreting something out of nothing because uh, somebody else created it. Well, but that's, the, I mean, that's almost what I want to ask is like on this podcast, we I love hearing about the um, idea of an actor, particularly if it's a new play, um, creating something that ends up on the page or that creates something that becomes the definitive legacy or like, have you ever had that where you have a discovery about a character, you make a choice that has changed the development of a piece? I mean, I think probably in the minutia of it, that's that's definitely true, or that I asked a lot of questions uh-huh. okay. that sort of led the writers in a certain direction. That's I can't so cool. say, I'm trying to think, like, I, I can't say that it was that I would have ideas that then were, you know, the character totally changed. Yeah. But I think... But the questions. Yeah, that I was able to sort of... Or, like, I remember in Peter and the Starcatcher mm-hmm. over time that I had the enormous luxury of Rick Ellis just sort of writing for me, that I, I felt like he mm-hmm. was... He, like, saw me, and suddenly Molly became, like, an extension of Celia. Uh. I know. Cool. So lucky. <laughs> um, but that I really, I I wish I was more of a creator. I wish that I mm. could go and sit down and say like I'm gonna I'm gonna make something for myself or I'm gonna make something. But I really, I am a like I am an interpreter in my heart. Oh, interesting. I think I very much think of you as a creator. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. <laughs> I, mean, I do. Interesting. The, My brother is a creator. Oh, sure. Well, sure. I am less so, I think. But in the, yeah, interpreter, creator. That I'm really happy. I think I am, I'm, I love the collaboration. And I think I, as I, especially as I've gotten older, have gotten pretty good at helping the creative process. Mm-hmm. But it's all because there's something there in the first place. Sure. And that is the actor's job mm-hmm. to work with what's there. Yeah. And if it helps guide it toward something different, great. Yeah. 
And that glass menagerie, I mean, that is an example of a revival that you, I think, were part of a production that pretty much reimagined that text. Yeah. Without that, changing much yeah. in the text itself. No. Yeah. I mean, that was an amazing experience because we had access to the three different editions of the Glass Menagerie, which is yeah, like the reader's cool. edition, the production edition, edition yeah. and then the London edition. And they, the estate gave us, like we would read all three. We, would, we sat around a table, would read a page from each and say, oh. and pick and choose like what we felt. That's cool. So it almost in that way was like this beautiful, and then sometimes in the rehearsal process would be like, can somebody go get the reader's edition and see if there's a better <laughs> line here? Because I cannot figure out how to do it. And in some cases oh. we would be able to do that. I love that. So lucky. But again, that was really John Tiffany. I think we all took John Tiffany's lead on that. And mm. he taught me so much about collaboration. And I would say but the last... Bart, I think, is the same way Bart Shear, that they did not come to the table with a lot of answers, but that they cool. had, they did come to the table able to engage with a lot of questions. They had questions themselves, and then they were very open and responsive to the questions that we had. Awesome. And that sort of process is, like, the best is the is the idea of questions then when it's set in stone all the questions have been answered or is it like there or are that, still yeah or that it, it it yeah that I think as an actor and maybe because I'm like trying to break myself of this of like being a, a super dutiful actor mm. um, and trying not like I think my identity as an actor is that I, I don't want to be <laughs> perceived as high maintenance. I'm like, let me give a, I want to be one of the, the, the good actors that's just like easy and fun and um, <laughs> and I don't want to like draw too much attention to myself or um, take up too much air in the room or take up too much of the process mm. so that when I actually need help, I'll get the help that I that I want. Mm. And I think this has served me, but it also really has not. Sure. That like, um, and that John Tiffany and Bart Shear could sort of withstand my questions. And, and not see it as high maintenance. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's so important. And that they both, I can remember times would say, where I would ask something and they would say, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. And then the next day would come in and say, I was really thinking about it and would have something for me. Cool. Yeah. Amazing. And like not necessarily a set in stone answer, but more like a, here's my thoughts on it. Yeah. What do you think? Right. And I think also like what I was saying about being a dutiful actor, that it's like if a director has an answer, that it is hard for me to remove myself from the answer. That it like, that I think that's why I keep coming back to the questions that, Mm -hmm. that, instead of the answers, that they would just present more questions. And that also is enormously helpful when you're in a long run of something, because then you're not playing the answer. You just have yeah. more questions to support you once you've like cycled through all of the ideas for a scene. And it's yeah. like, oh, wait, what, what was this conversation like? Yeah. And is there anything hmm. I could glean six months into the process? Totally. That might be helpful. Yeah. Like, I did. Oh, I, I'm glad that we asked about the epiphanies and discoveries because that really does happen. Or like the little boy crying in the audience is a different kind of like epiphany. Yes. I mean, that honestly. How do you not break? I we had to stop looking at him. Ugh. Where I was just like, this is so moving. This is like, that's one of my like most cherished memories in the theater, like of all time. <sighs> where I was just like, I cannot believe this tiny person is feeling these feelings for for something inside of a play and that he was so surprised by it and that he was so upset by it. It Mm -hmm. was just like really, really, really special. You are, yeah. I mean, I guess you and all actors, you're so empathetic. Of course, I feel like you would have to look away from something like that happening. Yeah, or just like, I can't can't um, live that happening right now. I'm not gonna be able to like say my lines if I (laughs) keep engaging with this little guy. (laughs) You can't interrupt the play to be like, we need Do to we talk to... Do we see what's happening down here? <laughs> totally. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you feeling about the state of Broadway and the theater in general? And, like, because I go back and forth on this um, in terms of, like, are we feeling optimistic about 
gender parity or diversity on Broadway or I kind of feel like sometimes it's a two steps forward, one step back. I think that's exactly right. Situation. Yeah. Like, do you get and discouraged? I feel and... very moved by this season of plays. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I feel like that we have Heidi Schreck yeah. and Taylor Mack yeah. and Lucas Nat. I mean, it's like we have like real, we got some downtown voices uptown. Yeah. And that is only good. Mm. I think, do I wish that there were more women in the creative positions on Broadway? Mm. Yes. Yeah. That weren't just costume designers. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, that that part of it, women and people of color, particularly on the other side of the table, mm-hmm. that's where I feel like Broadway still has a ways to go. And quite honestly, off-Broadway as well. Like, it's mm-hmm. better there, but mm. but Broadway certainly has has work to do. And it's, you know, it's tricky also because there are so few few women producers. There mm. are so few people of color in producerial positions. Like, yeah. it's... the top. Yeah. It's, that's the trickle down. And they're thing. the ones that hire the creative teams. Yeah. And so, you know, we... But I think I feel really proud. I think... I feel really proud to be a part of this season, particularly yeah. mm. as far as the plays go, because I think it is a super, it's not, it could be more diverse always. Always. But I think as as far as voices that we haven't heard before, it feels exciting. Yeah. And that's ultimately what it comes down to is the voices aspect and not necessarily like breaking down everybody's <laughs> race or yeah, financial yeah. background or like yes. <laughs> it's not about that it's about the idea of downtown voices even yeah like people yeah. that wouldn't normally have broadway shows i feel like there right. are a lot of those this season i agree which is great and so like and this is a bigger question too but like other than talking about it as we are like what can we or what can actors do in terms of um I almost want to ask, like, how can actors change the world, <laughs> you know, or, like in these t- in these yeah. trying times? I think you can look for the people that you want to collaborate with and try to um, make sure that those people are representing all of us. Mm. And and with those people, try to make the art that you want mm. to make. I mean, I think it's very hard because I'm in a position, I don't even know if I'm in a position to do that. And I feel like I have a wonderful standing in the theater community where I get to be picky and mm. have some say over my projects. But it's like mm. when I was young, I think actors can save the world by being storytellers and great empathizers. I mean, I really think that's the the this combination of sort of empathy and action, that it's like we are so yeah. good at seeing where other people are coming from and yeah. understanding why people act the way that they are. But again, it's like not an, it's not quite enough just to do that. It's right. like, I don't know, I feel like when I was, this makes me sound like, when I was like moved to Pennsylvania and worked for Barack Obama, which I did ah! <laughs> um, for like two months, that I was like, no one has ever been more qualified to knock on doors. And talk to people. actors. Yeah. And that it's like, I think there are a number of actors that's like, that is my literal nightmare. (laughs) Like, I'm here to be on a stage and perform, not to be myself, like, mm -hmm. knocking on doors in Pennsylvania. Mm. And it was uncomfortable. Like, I definitely Mm -hmm. wasn't like, this is a a natural fit. But at the end of the day, like, being with other people and trying to engage them about the election, I was like, I have a lot of tools. Amazing. That are helping me to do this. Yeah. And I guess that's really the thing. It's like what what it's not I remember like hearing some this was about like grief and when when somebody dies that we the people always say like oh my gosh what can I do? And mm. it's like that's not the good question for another person. The good question is what can I do? What am I a good cook? Can I bring them meals? Uh-huh. Am I a good organizer? Can I create the meal train? Can uh-huh. I? Am I good at picking out flowers? Am I good at childcare if that person needs? Like that. I think that's wow. in a similar way. Like with actors, it's like not what can I do, but like what can I do? What skills do I? Yeah, yes. you have. And how do skills. I like translate that into some sort of action? Yeah, 
I love that because I, I also feel like there's with the early career actors, it's easy to feel powerless as mm-hmm. we've discussed, and like knowing that um, your life experience, your blood, sweat, and tears in training or whatever, like you can actually apply those to other parts of your life. Yes, and yeah, create change. You can actually affect change with those. Skills. And I also think that's it's like. Now we're like we are, we've like zoomed out, and now I'm like gonna zoom in. But I think that that philosophy is like, what can I do? Is also like the key to being a great actor, which is like mm. instead of. I mean, I think I was like such a mimic for like the first oh. many years, particularly before I got to college. But even in college, mm-hmm. that I was just like, I'm just trying to do a version of what I like. Yeah. What or what I've seen. seen. Yeah, and what you know. And that that's totally, that's how it should start. Yeah, totally. But that ultimately what makes a great actor, I mean, it's like I think of like the first person that comes into my mind is like Laurie Metcalf where I'm like wow. nobody can do what she can do because mm-hmm. what can she do? She can be Laurie Metcalf. Yes. And that she <sighs> is like located in herself where her power is. And we all have that. <sighs> But it's so different for everyone. Yeah. And it can sometimes be very difficult to access or figure out to, like, to yeah. clear away all the other noise of, like, I want. But I want to be fierce. I want to be a great diva. I want to, like, <laughs> belt to a D. Oh, it's sure. Like, but, like, what can you do? Yeah. It's burrowing into your, your most self self. Yes. <laughs> your most. And, like, exploiting that for your profession. <laughs> Yeah, and figuring out yeah. like that's where that's my currency. And the uh, the uh, tuning out of other voices thing is like a sh- the shoulds mm-hmm. like of society of being like, well, I should have this or be this or ha- or be here. Mm-hmm. But the act of distinguishing between those shoulds and and finding the you you you. Yes, that's tough. Yes, that's what takes the right. And, and it's like it can be. It's so much easier just to like. <laughs> Look around and be like, well, I can, that that person isn't even that good at that and I can do that. Yes. But it's like when you have to look inside, it is more vulnerable, I think, and more yeah. challenging to to say like, what, what do I really have to offer mm-hmm. that's not superficial, that's like, that is your essential self that yeah. makes, that is what I think makes all great yeah. actors. And it's just a fact. It's just a guarantee that everyone has that individuality yes. in them and it's that's maybe hard to like believe Excavate. as yes. well yeah. yeah i think that's true everyone has that yep and it's like maybe it is helpful to imitate laurie metcalf to an extent maybe earlier in yeah. your career you know yeah. if that helps Completely. then get you to like yes this is where we intersect and this is where we don't yep this is just me yes and get and like, like believe you me i have stolen I steal on <gasps> continuing, like always stealing. Because that's the other thing about acting. Yes, yes so you see things and you're like, why did, why am I responding to this? Why is this so amazing? And you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to take some of that. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about like um, tricks, like skill, or just like emotions. Watch, or it's like thinking, like why? I'm gonna go back to Laurie Metcalf. Yeah, like I had this epiphany watching her in Three Tall Women, where I was like, I've spent my whole career trying to transform and think like how um like where is this character not like me and how can i exploit that and i was like Lori metcalf bends the character to her will she brings them to her yeah she doesn't try to disappear into them and i was like and that takes bravery oh my god (laughs) and it's so compelling to watch yeah yeah and it's it's almost just the confidence of knowing that you're compelling or yep. like believing that you're compelling. Yes. And maybe then that's what creates it. I was having that conversation just today because I kind of think Renee Zellweger is a uh-huh. great example of somewhere where I'm like, I can see her. I uh-huh. I see her tricks and the, her little foibles on screen, and it, it just enhances. It's like she. Yeah. It's like the character is sort of secondary. Right, and that it's you're more about the, her. Yeah, and that even like the flaws or the. Yeah. The 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 things that are not polished about it end up being what make it so compelling. Yeah, and that's that burrowing into your most individual self thing too. Of like, those are about the flaws as yep. well. Yep. And just avoiding cookie cutter mm-hmm. status. I think. Mm-hmm. God, that was brilliant. Um, I have written here. You mentioned grief. I have oh. grief colon memories slash feelings slash trauma slash recovery. Oh my god! As if that's a question. Right. Let me see if I can form that into a question. Um, 
how does grief or or intense emotions like that inform your acting? Because the other thing you said in your backstage cover story was in reference to like informing a character. You don't tend to do research. You said, I'm not big on research. That's what my imagination is for. Uh-huh. Obviously, there's both. Yeah. But like, what are the ratios uh, or tend to be of like emotion, memory, and then like, I guess, actually research, like technique stuff? Yeah. It's so interesting that you're asking this because I this is like something that I I was having a conversation with a friend who lost her father. And my mom has been dead for a really long time and has and I would say that I haven't that I don't feel her presence very often in my life or that I it's not one of those things where I'm like I you know, I feel guided by her principles because of the time that she had on this earth and that she was very powerful. And so in that way, she certainly lives through me and in me. Mm-hmm. But the closest I feel to her is when I am on stage or that I am. Mm-hmm. Um, there are so many parts of my life that show up or that um, that all of a sudden are are being examined that I don't even necessarily have control over. Yeah. Um, but that she, my relationship with her or things that she did, or I mean, I even remember there's this moment in To Kill a Mockingbird when uh, it's after Tom Robinson, like uh, Atticus takes a, a call and finds out that Tom Robinson has been killed. And he like walks out, Jeff walked out onto the porch and like something passed through his face. And I was like, that expression is the expression that my father had the day after my mother died and he had to make his three kids oatmeal. Mm. And he like didn't know what he was going to do. And there is no reason I would have ever thought about that moment again. And it's like such mm. a beautiful wow. and sad thing to experience. but. It is such a, I mean, it's it's hard being an actor in a lot of ways, but one thing I will be able to say at the end of my life is that it did not go unexamined. Like that there were so many moments and most of them career motivated that came back to me or that I re-examined just mm-hmm. because of something that happened on stage. And for that, I'm like so profoundly grateful. Yeah. It also does mean that there are weeks where I feel just beat up, <laughs> where I'm yeah. like all of this reexamination and all of this like yeah. memory or grief that I have carried around, you know, yeah. for so long has to continue to sort of be brought up. And some days you're like, Ugh, yeah. I just don't really want to do that. And the good thing is that some days I just don't like you no. don't need it and you don't have to. But like you said, it has to be brought up. Yeah. You can't ignore that. Yeah. I guess I'm just so happy to have a place to process it. I mean, I definitely have been in therapy for a long time, and that's a good place to process it. And I don't want my work to ever take the place of therapy, Uh, but I do think that they can (laughs) sometimes work hand in hand. Sure, yeah. It is therapeutic to be enacting another story or to be inhabiting a character. And to to have to go to places that – I think our brain is like, you know what? It's best to just sort of leave that there because that feels mm. hard and that mm. feels like, eh, let's not. Let's just not really touch that. And yeah. I think mm. um, I have felt so moved and also so sad by some memories that I have had or that I have thought about, particularly as they pertain to my mother, mm. that I just never would have touched before because yeah. it would have for me, for any number of reasons yeah well and it makes me think that your body sobbing that one day like there it is about listening to yourself and your your brain and your heart and your body and sometimes it is like a self-preservation thing of like well we don't need to go there yes and you can't possibly process all of this at once yeah. so no. we're gonna hold on to it i mean i think that's also been something that was so like a part of my son being born Mm -hmm. is that I felt like I had processed so much grief around my mother and in fact was like had a pretty 
healthy relationship with death and had a pretty healthy relationship with her dying. And then my son was born and I was like, oh, grief (laughs) is never ending. Grief is life's work. And how sad that made me. (laughs) And I was like, oh my gosh, I have this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to... I'm going to be processing this forever. But how beautiful it is to be in a profession that can make space for that. Mm. Um, yeah. I not can, as not as the only outlet, but yeah. as, a, as an outlet, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know what that saying is about the grief is the, a stone you carry in your pocket mm-hmm. or something. But I have found that it's more like a stone that you swallow. <laughs> it's inside of it. It's actually inside yes. of you. <laughs> yes. And some right. days you can really feel it, and some days you, it's there, and, and you don't feel it as strongly. I feel like. Yes. I, <laughs> I really agree with that. Thank you for going there with me. Oh, I, my gosh. It's, of course. It's really, my favorite stuff to talk I, mine about too. as far as what we do. and Yeah. I find it so fascinating, and, and I... Or maybe it's just selfish that I want my own. I want to Process work out my own demons. We all want that. <laughs> totally. I think we all want to feel totally. less alone in our grief and in our. Yeah, and, and it's a shameful thing too that p- people don't like to talk about. Yes, so. yes, that it, it's like only good for there to be more talk about grief. Yeah, it doesn't help for people to tiptoe around it for no. me. Like, I mean, there's a time and a place, but like. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank my you so much. Pleasure. Celia, this, this is, is so, so great. So, so wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad. In the Envelope, an awards podcast, is recorded at Lotus Productions, Hyperbolic Audio, and Big Yellow Duck in New York City, and Soundbox LA, Mark Grouse Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Like, subscribe, tell your friends, tweet us at In the Envelope, leave a review. We want to hear from you. Visit Backstage.com for more content and resources for working artists. And don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with a free trial by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout. Thanks, as always, to podcast producer Wiz, Jamie Muffet. You can follow him on Twitter at JamieMusicNYC. You can follow me, Jack Smart, on Twitter at JackSmartWrites. Thank you to the team at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. Peter Rappaport, Mark Stinson, Samantha Sherlock, Francis Ramos, Lauren Rout, Caitlin Watkins, Rowan al Khatib, and especially, should be Oscar nominee, Casey Howe. Thanks for listening. On the next episode, Tony nominee, Lily Cooper. Being as honest with yourself as possible, I think is just so helpful to like get through the ups and downs of this career, understanding that there's so much more to this business Uh, than talent, sadly. You know, there's a lot of being in the room with the right person at the right time. Yeah. Um, There's a lot Mm. of, you know, nepotism. And like sure. that's okay. That's real. That's that, that happens yeah. in every industry, Knowing every business. People, yeah. Uh, so, t- trying not to take things personally, but also being as honest with yourself as possible. Mm-hmm.